Figuring out how to wire up an electric vehicle can seem daunting if you've never done it before. In this video, I'm going to talk through and draw out the wiring diagrams for my Ninja 250 EV conversion. In the first video of this series, I put together an oversimplified block diagram that showed all the components that needed to go into an EV conversion. But as mentioned in that video, there is a lot of specifics missing from that oversimplified block diagram. I'm not an electrician, I'm not an electrical engineer, so it kind of took me a while to walk through the wiring design for my project. Now that I think I've got it all figured out, I've put together a few PowerPoint slides to help talk you through it. Although the wiring diagrams that are developed and discussed in this video were specific to my Ninja 250 EV conversion, they should be generally applicable to a wide variety of EV conversions. With that said, let's head over to the computer and I'll walk you through my wiring plan. Okay, so here we are. This time we're designing and developing the wiring diagrams that's gonna run the electric vehicle. So this is the current circuit definition that I have, and it's really not a circuit definition. It's a block diagram of components. What I really want is a legitimate circuit diagram that looks kind of like this one that another YouTuber, Gaius Garage, made. His diagram is one of the most clear and helpful that I found, but it was still kind of difficult for me to wrap my head around it. So in this video, we're gonna draw a circuit diagram of our own that is hopefully a little easier to follow. My approach with this is going to be draw out and explain individual circuits that I know I need, and that's gonna be broken out into three separate sections. First is the 12 volt stuff that my bike needs to be road legal, you know, like the headlights and the taillights and the blinkers and whatnot. And then I'm going to show a 72 volt diagram that has just the minimum number of components, minimum number of wires, just bare bones. What do I need to spin the motor? And then we'll add in a bunch of other stuff such as communication to the display, interlock circuits, switches, fuses, whatever. The next step will be to physically arrange all the components and wires on the workbench to actually perform a bench test. Uh, that, that's a little too much scope to get done in one video and so this video is going to be just the drawing out and explaining individual circuits. And then in some future video we're going to unbox a bunch of components and then physically lay them out on the workbench and wire them together and actually perform a bench test. Enough for the intro. Let's talk about what's supposed to happen when I turn my key switch. What I want to happen is kind of the same as what's on a regular motorcycle. When the key switch is on, the 12 volt stuff becomes enabled. So that's like the headlight, horn, the blinkers, the brake lights. All those things start working when the key is in the on position. And additionally, the coil on the contactor, that electromagnet that if we were to energize it would close the contactor, that's going to be on the 12 volt system. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out my video about the contactor. So here we go, 12 volt stuff. Let's start drawing what we know. We know there's gonna be a battery and the battery is 72 volts and that's too high. And so it needs to go to a DC-DC converter. The key switch is somewhere between the DC-DC converter and the battery. One of the outputs from the DC-DC converter is ground and the other output is 12 volts. That 12 volt leg from the DC-DC converter goes to all of my accessories. For example, when the key switch is on, the headlight should be on. And there's no switch there. When the key switch is on, the headlight is always on. That's why I've got that little running man there. But there is a switch for the headlight, and that's for the high beams. When that switch is closed, that'll enable the extra filament or the separate bulb that is high beam. Besides the headlight, there's also the horn. That's a momentary switch. When you press it, it's on. When you let go, it turns off. So if you press your horn button, 12 volts goes through the horn and then terminates at battery negative. Next up on my list is the blinkers. And that's actually two circuits, one for the left and one for the right. Same idea as these other ones. There's a 12 volt signal that goes to a switch. If the switch is closed for the left, it's blinking left. If the switch is closed to the right, it's blinking right. If the Ninja 250 had hazard blinkers, there'd be another circuit involved here, but it doesn't. So we're gonna just move right along. The next thing is brake lights. When I press either the front brake or the rear brake, either way, when either of these circuits close, the brake lights need to activate. There's gonna be two runs of 12 volts, one to that front brake switch and one to the rear brake switch, but then both of them need to lead to powering the brake light. Additionally, related to the brake lights is the always running tail light. So that one's not switched, it's just always on. Last but not least, 
there's a 12 volt circuit for the electromagnet that activates the contactor. So I want that circuit to be enabled when the key is in the on position. And then the switch to engage the contactor, I'm probably gonna use the big red kill switch on the right handlebar. So this feels pretty good. I can follow these paths, makes sense to me. As I was looking at the Ninja 250, I realized it's got fuses on a lot of these same circuits. The horn, the tail lights, and the headlights, and the turn signals. Clearly Kawasaki thought that was a good idea for a 12 volt system with 12 volt components to have fuses. So I think we ought to put them in too. On my diagram, I'm gonna have my fuses upstream of the switches. I don't know if I'll use the OEM fuse box, but wiring fuses in line shouldn't be too bad. So there you have it. That's all the 12 volt circuits that I think I need. So let's move right along to the 72 volt stuff. I wanna answer the question is what are the bare bones components? What's the absolute minimum number of connections that I need to spin the motor? If we're in the software world, we'd probably describe that as the minimum viable product. Like what does it take to just barely work? So here we go. We need the battery, we need the motor, and we need the motor controller. My motor controller is a Votol EM200-2 and my motor is a QS13890H. Even though these are the ones I'm using, this same general diagram should apply to a lot of different electric vehicle applications. The battery does not directly communicate with the motor. The battery sends power to the controller. So we've got a 72 volt line going here. It's a little thicker line because that's going to be a heavier gauge wire. That positive 72 volts needs to tie into the location labeled battery plus. Also, some large terminals on the controller are the phase wires. Those are labeled W, V, and U, and they're color coded, and those tie into the motor. And then the battery minus on the controller has to find its way back to battery negative. Another piece this system needs is the main shutoff switch, and I'm gonna be using a contactor for that. You can see in the diagram, it's like a switch, and then there's a coil, and that's the 12 volt coil that we talked about on the previous page. When this coil is energized, that switch is closed, and the controller gets the 72 volts to the battery positive. Now, worth noting, that 72 volts doesn't actually power the controller. That 72 volts is for powering the motor. There's a separate wire later on that powers the controller. Another thing that the controller needs is the input for the throttle. On the wire harness for the Votol EM200-2, the throttle connector is a three-wire cable that's pink, green, and black. That should just be a plastic connector that plugs right in. Pretty straightforward. So remember a second ago we talked about the separate wire that powers the controller? That's a different, thinner wire with 72 volts in it and it's labeled in the Votol documentation as the E-lock. Basically, this is what turns the controller on. Last but not least, there's another wire hanging off the motor that's actually a six wire plug that's yellow, green, blue, red, white, and black. And that six wire plug is the Hall sensor or Hall effect sensor. A Hall effect sensor is a magnetic sensor equipped on the rotor of the DC motor. The purpose of the Hall effect sensor is to detect a magnetic field and send a signal to the controller about the position of the motor. The motor controller uses this signal to decide how to adjust the power to the motor. So this seems all well and good, but the thing is that motor controller has a whole bunch of connectors on it. What are the rest of those things going to? That's the everything else portion of my explanation here. First off, there's two different wires labeled brakes. One is called high break and the other is low break. High break, as far as I understand, is basically using electricity to tell the motor to spin slower. Kind of like downshifting and letting the internal combustion engine slow you down. And that requires a 12 volt signal. By contrast, the low break strategy is kind of like pulling in the clutch. You're 100% reliant on your mechanical front and rear brakes. So yeah, that's high brake and low brake. I have to pick one of them, but I don't know which one I'm gonna use yet. I think what I'll end up doing is wiring it up such that I can change it from one to the other, and then take it on a test ride and see which one feels better. Another one of the pigtails on the harness is called the three speed. That enables low speed versus high speed, and if you don't do anything, it's medium speed. My current plan is to just set that up for high speed so I have the full power of the system anytime and I can just modulate with the throttle, but that's something I can always adjust in the future. Now, speaking of speed, there's a wire that comes out of the controller harness, the speed signal. It's just a single wire, it's a white wire. Where does that go? Well, this is a good time to talk about the display. The kit that I bought came with a small display and that display needs to know how fast 
the motor spinning. Another piece of the system that we haven't talked about yet is the brands of the battery or the battery management system probably go over the wiring of the battery management system to the battery when we build the battery in a future video but one of the things that the battery management system should be able to do is report the state of charge to the display effectively serving like a gas gauge two other things that will be on the display is that little blue indicator that the high beams are on and also the, the turn signal indicators now this is looking pretty good, but there's a couple things missing. For example, switches. For example, the 12 volt signal to activate the high brake should only be sent to the motor controller when the brakes are on. Similarly, if I decide to wire up the low brake version, that signal to the motor controller should only be on when the brakes are on. As mentioned earlier, this is what powers the motor controller. That needs its own on off switch. Now I think I'll probably end up wiring that to the kickstand. So if the kickstand is down, the motor is not turning. The motor controller is not even energized if the kickstand is down. Another component that I've read that is a good idea to have, not necessarily required, but a good idea is some big old fuse in the system. There's a lot of power in this battery and it's only rated for 150 amp continuous discharge. And the battery management system should be able to regulate that. Separately, the motor controller is rated for 200 amp continuous operation. If something's going over say 300 amps something's wrong right the batteries aren't rated for that and the motor controller is not rated for that so this should just cut off the system so I found a big fuse and matching fuse holder on DigiKey those should be here in a couple of days that covers all of the other stuff that I wanted to show there is one other thing that we should do because this is tying into the turn signal and this is tying into the headlight signal and these are tying into the brake signal let's go back to our 12 volt diagram and add in this tie-in if the high beam is engaged we're gonna fork off from there and report to the display that the high beam is on same for the left signal then for the right signal and for the brakes we're gonna send a signal to the motor controller that the brakes are engaged and depending on which one we go high brake or low brake that'll do its job so there you have it a somewhat simplified approach to the 12 volt system and the 72 volt system hopefully that's helpful to someone out there even if the wiring might seem a little complicated it's really not so bad once you break it down into the individual circuits if you have any feedback or questions leave them in the comment section I'll try my best to answer but we might also get a better answer from someone on the internet if you'd like to follow my project, be sure to subscribe, and as always, thanks for watching.